Okay, today we're going to talk about functions. So a function is a name block of code that our program can jump to, perform some action, and then return to the point where we started from. Okay, so here's a, here's a picture here. Imagine we were kind of going with our normal sequential flow of control. We get to this point where we want to call a function. Okay, uh, and then we go down in here to this block of code and we execute it and then when we're done we jump right back to where we started and we pick up with our normal sequential flow. So to call or invoke a function we give the name of the function and a set of parentheses. Okay, so here's an example of me calling a function called square root or SQRT. Here the identifier square root is distinguished from a variable name so x is a variable in this case, by the parentheses. Okay. The parentheses tell me that this is a uh, function and not a variable. Um, square root is a function that holds some code to find the square root of a number and to return that square root to be used in this arithmetic expression. Okay. Whenever you see a programmer, identifi programmer defined identifier, so a non-keyword, the presence or absence of parentheses tell you whether it's uh, a variable or a function. So like I said, x in this case is a variable, square root is a function. I know that because of the parentheses that follow the, the function name square root. Okay, so let me just show you very quickly a, a kind of a simple program that uses a function. Okay, so let's start here in main. We have uh, a C out, hello my name is, and then we get to this function call. Again, notice the parentheses. So that means the flow of control is going to jump down here to the function called print name, and I'm just going to C out uh, my name. And then when we come to the ending curly brace, that means we're going to jump right back to where the function was called, and we're going to pick up with our sequential flow. We'll do the next two C outs. Then again, we have this. Uh, function call. So the flow of control jumps down here, we do our thing, we jump back, and the program ends. Okay, so that's that's kind of the basics of uh, a function. Let's talk about the reasons why we would ever want to use functions. The first is it allows us to give or to create a modular design. And modular design refers to basically breaking a big hard problem into a group of smaller more solvable problems. So humans often get very scared when they're asked to solve big hard problems because well they're big and hard to solve. Okay, We we have long known that uh, one way to eliminate this fear is to break the big problem into smaller chunks. The smaller chunks are simpler and therefore easier and less scary to solve than the one big problem. Of course, doing this produces many small chunks instead of one big one, so you, you still do have to compose them all back together to get a solution to the big problem. Okay, but we'll, we'll talk about how to do that uh, in a second. So, for example, let's, let's say I wanted to uh, write a program to calculate um, somebody's yearly taxes. Right? Sounds like a pretty big program, right? Big and scary. But if we think about it, um, you know, maybe we could break that big problem into a series of smaller chunks. So first, whenever you're doing your taxes, you have to calculate your earnings. And then you have to calculate your deductions. And then you have to apply taxes on uh, whatever's left. Right? Okay. So let's look at one of these calculate earnings. Well, that's, that's also kind of a big problem. We could break that up into smaller problems. So earnings usually come in the form of a salary. That's, that's kind of the simplest case. But then there are some people who earn uh, money without uh, earning a salary. So maybe bank interest or uh, some people earn uh, from equities or stocks. Okay. So again, I'm just kind of taking the, a big problem and breaking it into smaller uh, sub-problems until I get to the point where you know I, I can't break a problem up anymore. It's so simple that I know you know basically how to solve that that problem. So each one of these boxes will eventually become a separate function in a program. And this has many implications that we're going to see with the other items in the list. Modular design is also a great way 
for us to fully understand all the pieces that are going to require uh, to solve a problem. So if I say to you I want you to write a tax program, writing down all these small pieces that make up the whole forces you to think about all the data and actions that are going to be needed to solve the problem. If you jump right into writing code before you decom decompose the problem like, like I have here, it's likely that you're going to wander aimlessly for long periods of time. And it's also likely that you might miss some opportunities to reuse code. So you should always think long and hard before you actually start writing code. Now I personally like to draw a lot of pictures of what I intend to do in code before I do it. Uh, drawing pictures is fast and cheap and if I get it wrong it's easy for me to throw out the picture and start again. Throwing out code that you've worked, eight on, for, worked on for eight hours is a lot harder than a picture you know you spent 18 seconds on. Okay, so that, that, that's a problem that when, once we start writing code we, we tend not to want to throw it out. So what I like to do is, is kind of draw the pictures first because those, those are really easy for me to throw out. Okay, another reason why we would want to use functions is it encourages team programming. So decomposing your system into functions allows a development team to work in parallel. Okay, it would be very difficult for a hundred programmers to write all of their code inside a single main function inside a single file. It turns out functions can be written in separate files and the compiler can link them all together. Then a group of de developers can each work on their own functions without stepping on each other's toes, and that, that's uh, practically very, that's a very good reason to use functions. Another reason why we might want to use functions is, is to reuse code. So finding the square root of a number is something that might need to happen in many different places in a program. Placing the code to find the square root inside a function means that only one developer ever has to write it, and any other programmer can can use that functionality simply by calling the function. This is much better than copying and pasting the code repeatedly because only one copy will ever be needed. If you do find yourself copying and pasting code, uh, you always run the risk of making a mistake in that code. So if there's a bug or if there's a mistake in that pasted code, you the programmer have to remember every single place you pasted it uh, and then go and find it and fix every one of your copies. If instead you use a function that's called whenever that functionality is needed and you find a bug, well you only have to fix the bug once and recompile the program. And all the code that's calling that function will now use the one and only fixed copy of the code. Okay, so let's let's look at uh, uh, this program printing my name without functions and then we'll we'll kind of look at uh, when when we use functions why is that so much better okay so here's here's the same program that prints my name uh, exactly like the, the program above and this one seems a lot simpler a lot more straightforward than remember the version that did have a function okay now this might not be very satisfying because Printing my name is so simple that using the function actually does make the program more complicated. But imagine for a second we got the name from the computer that you're logged into and using. Okay, this is a much more complicated scenario and more likely to have bugs in it. Now, let's say uh, to print a name, we first had to identify the computer that you were on, then access a database, perform a query, parse the results, and then finally print the name to the screen. Well, that's a, there's a lot more going on there, and because we want to print the name twice, it really does make a lot of sense to, to put that code inside a function. Okay. If we didn't use functions, okay, here's that same program, but here I just copied and pasted those steps, and I, I placed them all inside the main function. This copied and pasted code makes the uh, amount of code larger and more complex. Right? So main is quite a bit longer now because we copied and pasted. Um, also, if there's a bug in this code, remember we have to go and find every single place that we pasted it and fix it more than once.
Okay, so that's that's not good. We we would want to reuse this code inside the function uh, rather than copy and paste. Okay, last but not least, the uh, another reason why we'd want to use functions is to take advantage of this thing called abstraction. So abstraction, uh, or writing functions I should say, allows programmers to abstract away complexity. Now this is just a fancy way of saying that it's okay to be blissfully ignorant of how large swaths of your program actually works. Uh, it might not be apparent to you how to find the square root of a number, for example. Uh, even though you might not know the algorithm to derive a square root from a number, you still might know what a square root is and have a need to find one. So for example, you, you probably all remember the Pythagorean theorem uh, that's used to find the, uh, the length of uh, a side of a triangle. So it's something like this. You know, C squared is equal to A squared plus B squared, or uh, in order to find the length c, you find the square root of a squared plus b squared. Okay. Um, knowing how to derive a square root is not really important to you. You know the Pythagorean theorem and you want to use it. Now, not worrying about how to derive a square root, but still wanting to use the square root, is called abstraction. The details of how to write the code aren't important. You just want to use the code to help solve some problem. So if you have you know, one programmer who happens to have a mathematical background, that programmer can think about and worry about how to find a square root. Once that programmer solves the problem, the rest of the team can abstract the details of how away and never have to think about what it takes to derive a square root. Now this is very powerful because you can have experts in certain areas work in those areas, and the rest of the team doesn't have to have that same knowledge as your experts. And this is a really great way to partition the people on the de development team into units where everyone gets to work on things that, they, that most interest them and they don't have to worry about things that don't interest them. Okay, now let's talk about the, there are a couple different types of functions. Um, there are value returning functions and void functions. A value returning function is one where the program jumps to a block of code, performs some work, and then jumps back to where the function was called. But in addition, when the flow of control returns to where the function was called, a value is returned with it. And that value replaces the function call. Okay, so remember the example I gave earlier okay, where um, we had uh, x is equal to the square root of 16 plus 1. Okay, this is an assignment statement, and we're trying to assign a value to the variable called x. However, before the assignment can take place, we're, we are asking the computer to do some arithmetic, in this case, an addition. But before we can add 1, we first must resolve the value that we're going to add that 1 to. In other words, before the assignment the flow of control is going to jump to a block of code called square root. We're going to pass in this number 16 and the code inside that function is going to derive the square root which in this case is 4 and the flow of control is going to return to where the function was called and it's going to replace the function call with that derived value. So in other words you know when when this statement is being executed the flow of control is going to jump down to this block of code called square root and it's going to be executed from top to bottom and at the end we're going to know that the square root of 16 is 4 so when the flow of control returns back to where this was called we could think of the function call as being replaced okay so this whole function call is replaced by a single value in this case it's the number 4 so 4 plus 1 is 5. Now we can finally put the value 5 inside the variable called x. Okay, that, that's a value returning function where, the, again, the function call gets replaced by a value that can be used in some kind of uh, expression. Okay, um, that's kind of the, the more complex case. The simpler case is a void function. 
Okay. We're going to come back to value returning functions shortly. But uh, a void function is one where the program jumps to a block of code, performs some work, and jumps back to where the function was called. The function, however, does not return a value with, with the flow of control. Okay, so the print name function that I've been uh, looking at uh, is, a, is an example of a void function. Okay, so what this is, this is called a function definition. Okay, and it's made up of two parts. It's a function header plus a function body. And this is the function header. This is void, print name, and then we have these parentheses. Okay, this is the function body. Okay, so when you call this function, the flow of control starts right here, right after this opening curly brace. Then we do our thing, and then when we come to the ending curly brace, the function body ends. And whenever we come to that ending curly brace, the flow of control jumps back to where the function was called. Okay, so let's look at these in a little more detail. The, the function body is just a block where, um, you know, a block is just an a opening curly brace and a closing curly brace. Okay, and inside we, we do stuff. Okay. Now the function header is a little bit more complicated. With a function header we always have this thing called a return type, an identifier, and then lastly this thing called a parameter list. Okay, in the function header there's always a return type. We use void if the function is not supposed to return any value. When the flow of control returns to where the function was called um, and we're not going to return anything, that's, that's, that's an example of a void function. Uh, we're going to talk about other return types shortly, uh, but let's move on to the, the next piece of the puzzle here is the identifier. And an identifier is just a descriptive name for a function. So just like your variables should have names that describe what's being held inside of them, a function should describe what the function does when it's called. Usually we use verb phrases for void functions and noun phrases for value returning functions. So in this case, uh, this was a, a void function and we called it print name. That's a, more of a verb phrase than a noun phrase. Okay, lastly, each uh, function header has this thing called a parameter list, and the parameter list is used to send data into the function. For example, the square root function can find many different square roots, not just the square root of 16. So we need a way to pass a value into the function, right, when the flow of control jumps down to the function, we want to send some data along with it. And that's exactly what parameters are used for. Okay. Before I show you more examples of uh, fully formed functions, I want to take a, a minute here just to talk about these things called uh, function prototypes. So in C++, we know that before you can use a variable, you must declare the existence of it. Right? So um, before we can start using the variable called human age, we, the flow of control has to pass this point where we declare the existence of an integer called human age. Functions also have to be declared before they can be used. Uh, function prototype is the, the declaration that a function exists. It's very much like uh, the declaration of a variable. All function prototypes are added at the top of the file. Okay. So here's my same print name function and I've kind of glossed over this top part here. This is called a function prototype. Okay, and because the compiler compiles these files from the top to the bottom, um, we want to tell the compiler right away these we basically want to make a list of all the functions that are going to be in the program um, that we have written, and print name in this case is one of them. So the a function prototype looks exactly like a function header. And in fact, most of the time I do copy and paste the function header up at the top of the file and then I add a semicolon. Okay. And again, this is just the this is the declaration that we are going to have a function called print name. And the compiler needs to see that um, before we try and call the function. So here's the first time we call it. 
Um, because the compiler compiles the file from the top to the bottom, by the time it gets here, if we didn't have that function prototype, it would have no idea what we were talking about. It, it's not smart enough to just look a few lines ahead and say, oh yeah, there really is a function called print name. Okay, we have to declare the existence of that function up at the top. Um, so since we're talking about function prototypes, uh, it is possible, and, and you will probably do this many times, but you, you can call one function from another function. So here, just looking at the top of the file, I can see that we now have three functions. How do I know that? Because there's three function prototypes right here. Print name, print first, and print last. So what does print name do? Well, it, it calls the function print first. So let's kind of trace the flow of control here. If inside main, the flow of control gets to this point, it says jump down to print name. Now here's another function call. Again, notice the parentheses. So the flow of control will jump to the function called print first. We'll execute this entire function body, and when we get to the ending curly brace, we'll return to where that function was called, which is right here. And the flow of control will move on to the next statement inside print name. That's a call to print last, so the flow of control will jump inside print last. It'll do its thing, and uh, when we're done, the flow of control will return to where that function was called. And that just happens to be the ending of the print name function. That means the flow of control is going to jump back to where it was called, which was right here. And you know this this process would repeat if I called print name again. The 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 program remembers every single place where the function was called. You as a programmer don't have to worry about remembering that. the The system will take care of that for you. That's that that thing has a name that's called the call stack. And it's basically keeping track of all the function calls in your program. And then here, just as an example, I, I show you that, yeah, you can, you can call print first and print last individually, too. Um, so before we called them from within print name, now we're calling, it, calling them right from main. That's perfectly fine. You can call any function from, uh, from any point in your code. Okay, so it is, it is quite likely that you'll have a function that calls other functions. And that, uh, that kind of goes to the, the point I was talking about before, where it's common that we decompose a problem. Right? And then eventually, each one of these boxes becomes a function. That's why I named this one main, because that's, that's the starting point of the program. And if we're doing our tax program, we'd maybe first call the calculate earnings function and calculate deductions, and then lastly, apply taxes. Each one of these boxes becomes a function, and if there's a line coming out of the bottom of the box, that means we're going to call a function. Okay. And this may look complicated, but this is a very simple program. Okay. There, it's not unusual to have programs with thousands or tens of thousands of individual functions. Okay, now let's talk a little bit about uh, passing parameters. Okay, so this is a this is a way to get some data into a function. Right, so remember the square root. We we want that square root function to be able to find any square root, not just the square root of 16. So we we have to be able to pass some data into the function along with the flow of control, so that that piece of data can be used to uh, inside the function. Okay, so let's imagine for a second we wanted to write a program that will print out a box of stars. And we could do this in a couple different ways. One way we could do it is to just write several different functions. So when I mean a when I say a box of stars, I, I literally just mean a bunch of C outs where we get these these uh different dimension sized boxes. So here's a two by two, here's a three by three, here's a four by four. You know, I, I could go all the way up to a 20 by 20. Okay, these are all nice, simple functions, but in order to be able to print any size box, we, we would need to write many, many functions, right? So what if, for some reason, I wanted a 200 by 200 size box? You know, do I really want to write each and every one of those functions? 
It would be much smarter to write a single function that can print any sized box. Okay. And that's what I do here. Okay, so uh, I'm going to write this function called print box, and I'm going to pass into the function the size of the box that I want uh, printed. Now in my main, what I do is I basically prompt the user for a box size, and then I pass that value into the function. And that should print out a box of exactly that size, and the program should end. Okay, so let's look at the actual print box function. This is the parameter, and whenever we uh, list a parameter, we have to say the type of the data that we're sending in. Also notice it has a different name. Okay, up here, we when we call a function, what we pass into the function is called the argument. So box size is the argument. Size of box, that is what we call the parameter. So you're just going to have to memorize that. This is an argument. This is a parameter. Okay, and the parameter tells us the size of the box. So the way I decided to solve this problem was um, I'm going to have these loops where I'm going to go left to right, top to bottom. And I'm always going to keep track of what row and column number I'm on. So I'll start maybe at row 1. And I'll say, while the row is less than or equal to the size of the box, then uh, each for each row, I'm basically going to start the column at uh, column 1. And while there are more columns, I'm going to come inside here and, and basically check. I know along the border of the box is where I want the stars. So I know I'm on the border if, it, if I'm ever on row 1 or column 1, or if I'm ever on the last row or the last column. If any of those are true, I'm going to print out a star. Okay. If all of those are false, that means I'm on the interior of the box, and I'll just print out a space. Okay. And then I have my, uh, my counters get increased, and uh, after the, the inner while loop, I want to end the line, because the inner loop will print out everything for a particular uh, row. So once we're done with the row, we need to end the line and then move on to the next row. Okay, so this function, print box, I can now pass in any uh, non-negative or uh, any positive number, basically. And this will print out a box kind of similar to the boxes that I had here. So again, if it's row 1 or column 1 or the last column or the last row, we print a star, otherwise we print spaces. That was basically the algorithm. Okay, so th this this function can handle printing any size box. Um, a parameter is just a named piece of data that can be used inside that function. So when we pass a parameter into a function, there are always two ways of getting the data into the function. The two ways are called pass by value and pass by reference. So let's talk about pass by value first. Um, with pass by value, a copy of the argument is made in memory and the copy is used inside the function. Changing the parameter has no effect on the variable uh, in the, the calling function or the argument. Okay, so let me, let me try and make this a little more clear here. Here's a somewhat simpler program where we have this function called square num. Okay, so in main, uh, I declare this variable called number to square. So if we were to actually look at memory, we would see that number to square is here. Okay. Then I prompt the user to enter in a number to square and then the user is going to type something into the keyboard. Let's say they typed in in the number 10. Okay. That's going to go inside the box called number to square. Okay. Next we call this function. And only when we call the function does the flow of control jump down here. And again, number to square is called the argument. That's going to get passed down. And now, for the first time, uh, we're going to go into memory and carve out room for this integer called num. Okay. 
So pretend this didn't exist before. We're now for the first time going to create num. And what we're going to do is we're going to copy the value from the argument into the parameter. Okay. Now, inside the function, we're supposed to find the square of num. Notice we're going to use the parameter, not the argument. So we're going to say num is equal to num times num. 10 times 10 is 100. We're going to store that inside num. And notice that will have absolutely no effect on number to square. Okay, that's the hallmark of pass by value. And then lastly, we, we print out that value. Okay. So the point is there are, there are definitely two distinct and separate variables in memory when we pass by value. One holds a copy of the other and changing one will have no effect on the other. They really are uh, distinct. Okay, that's pass by value. There's, there's another way to pass a piece of data into a function. That's called pass by reference. So again, here's a slightly different uh, uh, version of the program. Okay, we have this function called square by reference, where now we have a, a piece of data called number, and we're going to prompt the user to enter in a number. We're going to um, call the function square by ref, and the argument is the variable called number. The flow of control is going to jump down here, and now notice this strange syntax here we have this thing called num, which looks like an int, but then we have the ampersand. The ampersand specifies pass by reference in C++. Okay, and basically what it means to, to pass by reference is um, instead of making a copy of the data, we're going to make an alias or another name for the argument. Okay, so let me, let me draw that picture for you. Okay, so we had the, the variable called number, and then, again, let's, let's pretend the user typed in uh, the value 10 for number. When we call the function square by reference, we're passing that by reference. So that means num is just another name for the exact same chunk of memory that number refers to. Okay. So an alias for the argument is made the parameter num is really just another name for that chunk of memory. So now when I say num is equal to num times num, okay, num in this case refers to this chunk of memory, 10 times 10 is 100, we're going to store that right back inside the variable called num, and that definitely does have an effect on the argument number. Right? So what's going to happen when we come to the ending curly brace, the flow of control is going to jump back here, and now, notice we're using the variable number, not num, but number. And of course, its value is now equal to 100. Okay, so any change to the parameter in the function will have an effect on the argument. In order to get pass by reference behavior, you're required to use that ampersand next to the parameter in the parameter list. By default, C++ uses pass by value. That, that, that means making a copy. Only if you use the ampersand do you get the pass by reference behavior. So you might be thinking, well, why would we ever want to pass by reference? Well, since parameters uh, that are passed by value are copied, it takes a certain amount of time to make that copy. The computer has to find an unused chunk of memory, and then it has to copy all the bits from the argument over to the parameter. Now, if the piece of data we're, we're passing is quite large, for example, an entire MP3 file, making the copy might take a significant amount of time. To make an alias, okay, or to create this, this uh, reference parameter, takes almost no time at all. Therefore, passing the piece of data by reference saves a significant amount of time uh, and work that the computer has to do. Um, Okay, let's go back and talk about uh, um, 
value returning functions. So these are ones where there is a value returned with the flow of control. Okay, and the function is replaced, the function call is replaced with that value. Okay, so here's, here's an example of a program that has a function called square. Okay, and notice the return type here is not void anymore. Okay, um, all functions that return a value must have this statement inside it somewhere that returns. So return is a keyword. Okay, so th this is a function that's supposed to square a value. So in main, we prompt the user for a number, and then notice here, we're calling this function square and passing in uh, number is the argument. Okay. So what's going to happen is the flow of control is going to jump to this function called square. And then here I just do some things. I, I declare an integer called num squared, and I take the parameter, which I happen to pass this one by value. So num is really a copy of number. Right? And I, I take num and I multiply it by itself and I store that inside the variable called num squared. Then I have this line that says return num squared. This does two things. It causes the flow control to immediately return to where the function was called, in this case right here, and it also says what value to return. Okay, So whatever variable or whatever value we have here is going to replace the function call. So if I passed in 10 for the num, num squared should hold 100. This says basically return to where the function was called and have the function call replaced with the value 100. Okay. So whenever you have a value returning function, in the function header you must say what type are you going to return. So this one I happen to know was an, an integer. Okay. Uh, if I was returning a float, I'd have a float. If I was returning a string, I would return a string. Okay. Here's an example of another uh, program that has a function that returns a string. So again, it's this is a, a function called change name. It takes three parameters by value, a first name, a middle name, and a last name. And what it's supposed to do is do some do some work and return a single string. Okay, so when I call main, uh, change name from main, I pass in my first, middle, and last name, and this whole thing is going to re be replaced by a single string, which happens to be, it's going to be my last name, a comma, my first name, and my middle initial. Okay, so that whole, this function call is going to be replaced by a single string, which I'm then going to store in this variable called name, and I'm going to print out that your name is and it should should hold that uh, formatted string. Okay, so what does this function do? Well, first thing it does is it creates a string variable called new name, and then I basically concatenate these strings together in a slightly different order. Concatenate just means push together uh, strings to make one big one. So I take the last name, and then I uh, put a hard-coded uh, uh, comma, then I do my first name and a space, and then this is how you grab uh, a single letter from from a string. This says uh, go to position zero of the string of the middle name, and uh, uh, just grab the the middle initial, and then add a period. Okay, so that creates a, a one big string with last name, first name, middle initial, and then when the flow control gets here, this says to return that new string to where the function was called. Okay, and again, that's going to transform these strings into one string in this uh, last name first, first name uh, next format. Okay, so those are uh, functions. And again, functions are, are very useful. We're, we're going to start using functions for just about everything because we don't want to write an entire program in main. We want to be able to decompose a problem into these smaller chunks 
and each one of those smaller chunks is going to be a function.